epiphania, it's a Greek word, epiphania, and we get the word epiphany from that word. And literally it means manifestation, right? An appearance, an expression of something. In the church calendar, we mark the Feast of Epiphany on the 12th day of Christmas, right? Today is actually the 12th day of Christmas, January the 6th. And we associate Epiphany with the very familiar story of the visit of the wise men, or the Magi, Jesus. We know the story, I just told it to the kids. The Magi follow the star to Bethlehem. They enter into the house where Mary and the baby Jesus are. They're filled with overwhelming joy. And once they're in that house, they kneel down and they pay homage to Jesus, offering him their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And the story is a story of adoration, of welcome and proclamation that this child, Jesus, is not only the king of the Jews, but far more than that, that Jesus is the son of God, the king of kings, the Messiah, the savior of the world, the manifestation of the divine, in human form. That's why the story is an epiphany. Right? It's the manifestation of the, the, the divine God in the flesh, in human form. It's an epiphany. What do we do with epiphanies? What do we do with epiphanies? What do we do with the story from the gospel? The story of the Magi's visit to Jesus, falling as it does near the beginning of every new year, often it carries with it associations of newness and resolutions around our spiritual journeys as well, right? One of my favorite Christmas cards is one that portrays the wise men depicted as kings with crowns, riding camels, and following a star. Here's a version of that card, right? You've all kind of seen this. There's so much that's wrong with this, with this depiction, right? The original Greek text calls them magi, not kings, not wise men. They were most likely astrologers or priests. And we really have no idea of how many of them there were. We assume that there were three of them because only three gifts are named. We actually don't even know if they were men or maybe women. And as for the camels, well, they're as mythical as the donkey that Mary rode to Bethlehem. There's no mention of the camels of the wise men in the Bible. Now, of course, in this digital age, nothing remains sacred for long. So maybe you've seen this new take on the visit of the wise men. Right? You can't read that. It says, after the three wise men left, the three wiser women arrived. <laughs> and the first one has fresh diapers. The second has casseroles for the week. And the third has lots of formula. You know, Ultimately, it's not whether it's three wise men, three wise women, whether they're magi or kings, whether they're riding horses or donkeys or driving Teslas. The most important part of the card has always been for me the inscription, we'll go back to that, the wise still seek him. Right? The wise still seek him. Maybe that's one of our resolutions for the new year. Let me just leave it, leave it on that slide going forward. Okay? Maybe it's one of our resolutions for the new year seek more Jesus in our spiritual life, right? The wise still seek Him. That's our resolution, to, to seek more Jesus in our spiritual lives. Maybe this is the year that we resolve to grow in our maturity about what it means to be a child of God, what it means to be a person of faith, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Maybe we've made that promise internally to ourselves and we haven't really told anybody else about it because Stuff about our own faith and about our spiritual lives, we don't typically share publicly. We don't go around saying, I'm going to be a better Christian this year. Right? We kind of hold that in here. Hopefully, you know, hopefully we'll get there. If we made that resolution to seek Jesus more, if that's what you've made this year, to seek Jesus more, wonderful. It's great. But I also want to give you a warning, which is be careful what you seek for. Be careful what you search for. There's a lot in this story that we often overlook. You know, for the people who were given the title wise men, they were not very smart. They, were, they seemed anything but wise. They see this new star in the sky, and they understood it to be a portent of something really significant. So they follow the star to Jerusalem, where there's a guy named Herod, who's the king. 
And they go to Herod and they ask him the question, excuse me, king, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? It's like going to North Korea and asking Kim Jong-un, hey, buddy, could you point me to the place where the kid that's going to overthrow you is going to be born? Maybe they're book smart, right? Maybe they've read lots of books. Uh, but they don't seem to be too street smart. You, you don't walk into the king's palace and say, where is your overthrower being born? Right? There's a lot I could say about Trump, but I won't. <laughs> well, Herod, he isn't the reigning king of the Jews for nothing. Right? He's not a stupid man. He's disturbed by what he hears, but he plays it cool. He's frightened, he's scared, he's actually paranoid. Remember, Herod is the king who had three of his own sons murdered because he was afraid they wanted his throne. This is a king who is not above killing his own family. Jerusalem, all of Jerusalem knows that no one's safe. No wonder they're all afraid. But Herod doesn't let on about his fear. He calls his advisors and says, you know, where is, where is this, this baby to be born? And they tell him, well, it's in Bethlehem, this little insignificant town where the prophets have said that the Messiah would come from. And then in his best diplomatic, officious tone, Herod says to the Magi, please search diligently the child. And when you found him, please come and tell me so that I too may go and pay him homage. The Magi thank Herod, and they set out. And we know that they do find Jesus in Bethlehem, and they probably would have gone right back to Jerusalem on their way home, and told Herod exactly where, they could, where he could find Jesus. Except that they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, and so they left for their home country by another road. Have you made any New Year's resolutions? Or are you past that? Have you made any New Year's resolutions? You know, you know what's similar about a lot of New Year's resolutions, other than the fact that we don't keep most of them past the first couple of weeks? I think that most of our resolutions have a common element, which is that they're about our desire to be more in control. Most of our resolutions are about our desire to be more in control. We want to master our cravings. We want to control our appetite. We want to lose weight. We want to give up an addiction to something. We resolve to learn a new skill, to take a course of action that will improve who we are. We make a resolution to be more caring this year, to expand our sense of compassion, to be more disciplined in the exercise of our faith. Most of our resolutions are about control. Control over the kind of people that we want to be. Control over the kind of life we want to have. It's like a map. We know where we are. We know where we want to get to. And we have a pretty good idea of what we need to do, what we need to do to get from here to there. Right? Of course, it's not always easy, but we have a pretty good idea. But the text tells us that when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to Jesus, we need to be careful about what it is that we're searching for. The Magi found the one who was born King of the Jews. They were filled with overwhelming joy. But not too long after that experience, they get a warning. Don't go back to Herod. Don't go back to Herod. Now you gotta imagine a little bit here, right? Imagine a little bit here. Everyone in the area knows that there's this traveling troop of visitors from the east. They're different. They don't look like the people. They don't dress like the people. Word has spread from Jerusalem throughout the land. These are Gentiles. The Gentiles in a Jewish land, they stick out like Donald Trump would if he were to visit North Korea. <laughs> so now they've got this revelation from the angel. And they have to sneak back home and they have to avoid any contact with Herod or his lackeys. Right? So all of a sudden, risk has entered into the equation. Risk has entered into the equation. They're no longer in control of their own situation. They were following the star, they went and got permission 
They got good guidance. They found Jesus. They found the baby. They worshipped the baby. But all of a sudden, risk has entered into the situation. They can't go back to Herod. They have no map for this part of the journey. And so really what the text is telling us is that if we encounter an epiphany, we've got to be prepared to lose control. Right? If we encounter an epiphany, we've got to be prepared to lose control. What do we do with epiphanies? When God is made manifest in our lives and in the life of the world, what does that do to us? If we take it seriously, we have to confess that God then becomes the one in control and not us. Right? God is the one who's in control, not us. The response to epiphany is not control or confidence. It's actually obedience and trust. Obedience and trust. If we're honestly going to search for a closer relationship with Jesus this year, if we really want to grow in our faith as followers and as disciples of Jesus, we have to be ready to embrace embrace risk. We have to be ready to be told to take a different path than the ones we're used to. We have to be prepared to travel along a less familiar road than the one that we're currently on, maybe even one for which there is no map. Will this be the year when instead of already making up our minds about what we'll do in terms of our spiritual growth, you know, maybe you resolve, I'll read, more, I'll read more Bible, I'll read a chapter a day, or I'll pray more, I'll pray for an hour a day. Maybe I'll serve more, I'll serve more in the church, I'll serve more in my community, which none of these are bad things at all, but what if instead of retaining our control over what we think needs to happen, I'll do this, I'll do that. What if this year we allow ourselves to be open to what God might have in mind for us as individuals and as a church here at RPC. If that's the year it's going to be for us, we have to listen carefully. Because the voice of Herod, right? Herod's voice is always among us, often in the guise of reason or diplomacy. Right? Herod's voice is probably the most common voice we hear. It's the voice that we expect the one with authority in this world. Herod's is the voice of safety. Herod's is the voice that says, you know, people don't expect that much, right? They don't really expect that much of you. Go back to Jerusalem, report back to the authorities, and you get to go home just the way you came. You get to go back just the way you came. Do what you're told. Do what's expected. Don't, don't risk too much. Don't risk too much. You know, but there's another voice. This is a voice that comes when we're not really expecting it. It's the voice that tells us to travel by a different road. Herod's voice would ignore the epiphany. But the Magi now have experienced too much to remain the same. Be careful what you search for, because if you find it, when epiphany finds you, the road, the road from there can't be the same. It can't be the same. Can, can, we, can we understand that as we begin this new year, that all of our resolutions, as well-intentioned as they may be, cannot take the place of openness, our openness to the epiphany of God, the revelation of God's Spirit for us and for the church. You know, epiphany is really not about us. Epiphany is not about what we're going to do. Epiphany is about God, what God has done, what God will do, what God wants us to know. God wants us and invites us to worship and kneel and offer our best with overwhelming joy. If we seek Jesus, a closer relationship with Jesus, the danger is that we just might actually find Him, right? We might actually find Him. And if we do, it will leave us less in control than when we started. It will leave us less in control. Is that what you want? Is that what we want? Are we willing to accept that? Can you imagine accepting that? Can you imagine letting go of control and allowing for risk to enter into your spiritual journey? A risk that might actually spill out into actually how we practically live our lives, not only how we think about it, but how we 
practically live our lives and the choices that we make about where we're going to invest our time or our energy or our love or our treasure, about who will accept into our lives, who will embrace, who will forgive, who will love. If we decide that we'll be open to epiphany, and all we can do is take it one step at a time, right? We can't plan for the whole year. We can't figure out what we're going to do. We can only take it one step at a time, trusting that God will direct our journey. Father Richard Rohr, who is a Franciscan priest, writes that the pattern of growth and healing, which is always through loss and renewal, is the way that life perpetuates itself in ever new forms, right? The pattern of loss the, the pattern of growth and healing through loss and renewal is the way that life always perpetuates itself into ever new forms. But those changes, right, those changes can feel like death and can disappoint us and usually scare most of us. And so often we retreat back to the status quo, to the things that we are familiar with, the things that we think we have some modicum of control over. But in doing that, we end up often worshipping old things as substitutes for eternal things. We worship old things as substitutes for eternal things. But when we recognize this pattern of constant change, yearning and developing, we also then come to recognize and understand that the future is in God's hands. The future is in God's hands, not ours. And we humbly agree to hold the present with a tentativeness that we cannot control or predict. Right? We come to hold the present with a tentativeness that we can't control or predict. It's hard. It's hard not to be in control because it is unpredictable. There might not even be any maps for the journey that we'll be taking this year. And we're going to have to learn to trust in ways we never thought possible. But trust this, trust this, that the God who comes to us in Epiphany is a God who is for us, for all of us. That's what's revealed in Jesus, isn't it? That's the Epiphany revealed in Jesus, isn't it? That God is for us, that God is for all of us, so much that God chose to become one of us. Not so that we'll be spared the heartbreaks of human existence, so that when our hearts do break, for whatever reason, the one who is for us, the one who is near us, the one who is one of us, will help to heal us and give us the courage to hold on to hope, hold on to hope, and live with the embrace of love and not fear. God is for us in Jesus Christ, and in coming as a baby in Bethlehem, God promises that God will not leave us alone. Alone in the darkness of pain or loss, loneliness or fear. The epiphany of God in Jesus is the promise that light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not and will not overcome it. That despair will never swallow up our hope. Will we trust this? Will we trust this? It is a new year. It is time for a new beginning. If this is the year that we truly want to grow in our relationship with God, with Jesus, in the way that we'll live as the people of God, then maybe it's time to trust and let go of our resolution to be in control. Let go of our resolution to be in control. Learn to trust. Maybe it's time to ditch the maps that we've used before because they only take us down roads we've already been. Right? It's time to go someplace different. If we hope to go someplace different, then we have to be open to epiphany. We have to be open to risk. We've got to travel by a different road, one without a map, and learn to trust God on our journey. Thanks be to God.